The RS-28 Sarmat, dubbed Satan II by NATO, has been widely reported to have a top speed of 7 kilometers a second and an expected range of nearly 10,000 kilometers. This would allow Moscow to attack European cities as well as reaching cities in America's west and east coasts. And it's also reported the missile could destroy an area the size of France or Texas. The Sarmat has been designed to outfox anti-missile shield systems. According to the Daily Mail, the Russian Defense Ministry plans to put the Sarmat into service in late 2018. Russia says NATO's enhancement of military presence on its eastern side will not remain unanswered. Russia's permanent representative to the alliance said NATO's activities are clearly aimed at military force projection in the Black Sea and Eastern Europe. Alexander Grushko added that the biggest military buildup along Russia's borders since the Cold War has no anti-terrorism value and is not bolstering European security, rather it's creating additional obvious risks. He also warned of NATO and the United States' active exploration of the Black Sea waters with multifunctional combat platforms which have a serious strike and missile potential. Red alert in a Soviet-style nuclear bunker where a couple of Russians are racing to prevent a catastrophic strike on the United States. Nuclear bombs will be launched in one hour. The aim of the quest, the latest gaming craze in Moscow, is to find the nuclear launch codes and deactivate a hidden red button. It's already been pressed by a mad Russian general. Of course, it's complete fantasy, but amid the current tensions with Russia, it all feels a little unsettling. Are you worried that something like this could happen in real life? Of Actually, course. I'm not. No, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it. I'm worried because it's very stupid information for both sides. And I know that normal people in all over the world, they don't want any war. world we are anonymous for the last two months we have been consistently reporting on a possible global conflict world war three between the united states and its allies in the west and russia and its allies in the east the dispute on the south china sea has severely damaged the united states relations with the people's republic of china after the permanent court of arbitration in the hague ruled that china's nine dash line claim in the south china sea and its land reclamation activities on islets are invalid and unlawful. The United States has been preparing to sail in the area under a so-called freedom of navigation principle. This has angered the Chinese. In August, the Chinese defense minister, Cham Wangquan told his country's citizens to prepare for what he described as the people's war at sea. Mr. Wang Quan was referring directly to the United States' planned provocation under the pretext of freedom of navigation. China has since vowed to take all necessary measures available to protect its sovereignty over the South China Sea. This flotilla of eight ships headed by the Admiral Kuznetsov has headed down the eastern coast of the UK uh, and of course into the English Channel, into the Dover Straits. Um, the Norwegian Air Force filmed them when they were uh, off the Shetland Islands. Those are some pretty great pictures. And then locals and media gathered to watch them in Dover. And of course they could see them off the coast because it's just 21 miles wide, that stretch of water that was earlier on Friday. And of course they're being watched very closely by ships from the navies of a number of different countries. There's the uh, UK's HMS Duncan, of course, which has been man-marking uh, the flotilla, according to the Defence Secretary. Uh, the Norwegians, the Finnish, they all have ships in the area that are watching uh, the progress of these destroyers and several NATO vessels and planes as well. Extraordinary display of Russian military power just a few miles off the British coast. One Moscow newspaper called it an armada and its chosen route straight down the English Channel 
is likely to have been chosen deliberately. The warships could have gone round the north coast of Scotland, but this was the route that sent a powerful message, one which a former Royal Navy Admiral said was a wake-up call. Since the end of the Cold War, we've allowed our capabilities to decline, uh, and I also think our skills have declined as well. We need to get back into the game of actually countering the Russians whenever they seek to coerce either European nations or project power like they have done with this task group. The task group will be reinforcing what's already a big Russian presence in Syria. Today, the EU, blocked by Italy, stopped short of threatening sanctions against Russia for what it called atrocities, like the bombing of civilians in Aleppo. While Moscow's ambassador to Brussels denied that this was all a massive demonstration of hard power. Syrian rebels say they're pushing forward with a huge offensive aimed at breaking a weeks-long government siege on eastern Aleppo. At least 15 civilians have been killed in heavy shelling and suicide car bomb attacks, among them a number of children, according to the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Over a hundred people are said to have been injured since the operation began on Friday morning. <laughs> Russian news agency Interfax later reported the Defense Ministry had asked President Vladimir Putin's authority to resume airstrikes against militants in the east of the city, following a 10-day pause. <laughs> Fierce fighting on the front lines of Eastern Aleppo. Even as opposition fighters launch a large scale offensive on the government held west of the city, a number of groups are trying to break the government siege of opposition held areas. <laughs> We are fighting the regime forces on every front in the east to ensure they don't reinforce their colleagues in the west. Until recently, Russian and Syrian airstrikes had killed hundreds in the east of Aleppo. There is a pause in those attacks and Russia says it won't restart them just yet. But the opposition fighters say they are not taking any chances. Here, children help them burn tires and keep on replenishing the fires. The smoke is meant to obscure rebel positions from the view of Syrian and Russian pilots. The offensive has been weeks in the making. The rebels have brought with them plenty of firepower. Hundreds of rockets targeting government positions. But they have just something as powerful. A new unity. And suicide car bombs in numbers far greater than before. Fierce fighting rages in the Al Zara neighborhood of northwestern Aleppo. Opposition fighters launched a counteroffensive on government held parts of the city on Friday. A Syrian pro rebel media outlet announced on Saturday rebels had taken the residential suburb of Dahiyat al Assad. Iraqi commanders say ISIL militants south of Mosul have been withdrawing north of the city, taking hundreds of civilians with them. NBC's Matt Bradley reports from Iraq. ISIS is going door to door in towns and villages south of Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, demanding that civilians move north, marching them north into Mosul proper, where they'll join some 1.2 million other civilians who will no doubt be used as human shields. This is what the Associated Press and Reuters are both reporting this morning. It's a troubling new development, and what this indicates, if anything, is that ISIS is planning on making a last stand in Mosul. There had been some talk before that maybe ISIS would forfeit the city and move west into Syria and take up positions in Raqqa with civilians and with their families, with the fighters from foreign areas who come to this area in order to defend the so-called caliphate that they declared two years ago. This development shows that this could be a suicide mission and that Iraqi forces in Peshmerga were based here in northern Iraq could be in for a long and blistering battle to take back Mosul. It's feared Iraq could be facing the worst humanitarian crisis in its history. More than a million people in Mosul are expected to be impacted by the military campaign aimed at retaking their city from ISIL. 
Those who've already fled have been relocated in five camps near Mosul. Aid groups are warning that facilities in the region could be overwhelmed. We left the village, he says. We went from house to house until we were able to escape. The situation was difficult. There were no facilities, no electricity, no water. Our life was very difficult. The Russian military has accused the U.S.-led coalition of bombing civilians and airstrikes in Mosul and nearby areas. Sergei Butskoy, the military's general staff, said that more than 60 civilians have been killed and 200 wounded in such strikes over the past three days. Butskoy said that a U.S. jet struck a school for girls on Friday in the southern part of Mosul, and airstrikes targeted residential areas in several cities near Mosul over the weekend. The Russian military official noted that Daesh terrorists continue moving from Iraq to Syria, while around 300 terrorists have already arrived in the city of Deir al-Zor from Mosul. Anti-government protests are once again erupting across Venezuela. On Tuesday, the opposition-led Congress voted for impeachment proceedings against President Nicolas Maduro, accusing him of violating the Constitution. It's a symbolic gesture because the assembly has been stripped of most of its powers. The opposition is upset the pro-Maduro Electoral Council tossed out their recall referendum. Scuffles in Venezuela's opposition-led National Assembly as lawmakers debate whether to put President Nicolas Maduro on trial for violating democracy. One of Maduro's allies tells the opposition it doesn't have the courage to go through with it. The opposition says Maduro is undermining the legislature to strengthen his grip on power. But either way, Maduro's socialist government says these hearings are meaningless because it's already declared Congress illegitimate. It's all about the economy. Protests like this one in San Cristobal accuse Maduro of incompetence and economic mismanagement. And public anger is growing after plans for an opposition referendum to remove Maduro from power was suspended. His foes accuse Maduro of ruining the economy as triple-digit inflation and food shortages have people routinely skipping meals. In neighboring Colombia, peace talks between the government and the country's second biggest rebel force postponed. Negotiations with the leftist National Liberation Army, or ELN, were to start Thursday in Quito, Ecuador. The government wanted the rebels to first release an ex-lawmaker they're holding hostage. Well, this, this, this did not happen. The peace talks were meant to coincide with an historic agreement with the country's biggest rebel group, the FARC. That accord was narrowly rejected in a referendum this month. Overnight, police held the ground where they clashed with Native American protesters near Cannonball, North Dakota. An army of 200 officers clearing demonstrators, blocking a highway used to access a controversial oil pipeline under construction. Many of the protesters would get right in the faces of the officers and, and say nasty things to them. What lengths is North Dakota willing to go to defend a multi-billion dollar oil corporation? Many are raising questions now as to the level of force that was used on the activists. RT correspondent Alexei Yaroshevsky has that report. In London, hundreds of people have marched on Downing Street against police brutality and suspect deaths in custody. When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Back up, back up. We want freedom, freedom. All these sexist, racist cops, we don't need them. A powerful earthquake has hit central and southern Italy. According to the U.S. Geological Center, the magnitude 6.6 .6 quake centered six kilometers north of the town of Norsa. The Templar was also felt in the capital, Rome. Many buildings have collapsed across central Italy, including Norsa. Emergency workers say a number of people have been injured, but no deaths have been reported so far. A series of strong earthquakes struck the area on Wednesday. 
Dramatic footage has emerged of the moment a road bridge collapsed on a busy road in Italy. One man was killed and five others hurt in the incident in Lecco near Milan on Friday evening. The bridge buckled when a truck weighing more than 100 tonnes drove over it. That sent the vehicle and concrete structure crashing down, totally crushing one car below. Anas, Italy's road agency, has blamed local authorities, saying it called for the crossing to be closed hours before. Prosecutors have launched a criminal investigation. Now, Turkey's president says his government is soon going to ask parliament to reintroduce the death penalty. Recep Tayyip Erdogan made the announcement while addressing supporters who were marking the 97th anniversary of the Republic of Turkey's foundation. He said a capital punishment will be a proper retribution for those behind the failed mid-July coup. He also rejected the West's criticism of his post-coup crackdown, saying that he does what his nation needs him to do, not what the West dictates. The death penalty was abolished in Turkey back in 2004 when Ankara was trying to muster support from European countries for its bid to join the European Union. Italy's once trustworthy banking system appears to be on its knees. The overall amount of non-performing loans or loans overdue held by Italian banks has reached an estimated value of 360 billion euros, roughly a third of all the bad debts at European Union banks. In simple words, Italian banks are struggling to recuperate both the capital and interests of the money they have lent in past years with excessive carelessness. Italy's banks are neck deep in non-performing loans. Now the question is how anyone can believe that no bank Bankers saw it coming. How policymakers and government regulators could not anticipate that lending money to individuals who wanted to be entrepreneurs with no experience at all, or on the condition they would buy the bank's stocks, would take the country's banking system to the brink of collapse. It towers above Frankfurt, and for many, a collapse is unthinkable. Deutsche Bank's results have helped to lay those fears to some extent. Germany's biggest lender made an unexpected but relatively small profit of 278 million euros. It was thanks to a 14% rebound in bond trading, but there's still no sign of a settlement with US justice authorities. They're still in negotiations with the DOJ to try and bring the fine down from $14 billion down to something that it considers more reasonable at around uh, $5.6 billion, which has been set aside now in litigation fees. So it does look like that we are seeing some progress here, but I think people are still going to remain concerned. CEO John Cryan has vowed to redouble restructuring efforts. He also wrote to staff warning the situation will stay difficult for a while. This is a massively st systemically important bank, uh, not just in Germany but in the Eurozone as a whole. I think the, um, the other concern is, while well, aside from the fact that the bank is so big and probably is too big to fail, um, it does just reignite these concerns about the banking region in the Euro area as a whole. Greece is to receive $3 billion of loans under a bailout agreement with its international lenders. Eurozone officials made the announcement in a statement saying the loan is an indication that the Greek are, quote, steadily making progress in reforming their country. The disbursement of the newly approved financial aid marks the formal end of the first review of Greece's up to 86 billion euro bailout, which was agreed to in August 2015. Right now, we are getting multiple reports of strange lights in the sky over the East Valley into our newsroom. This video is just in showing an unidentified object flying over Gilbert right now. We are getting similar reports from Queen Creek and also Globe at this hour. Yeah, in that video, you can kind of see the lights out there in the distance. Uh, witnesses say there are multiple lights as well as helicopters kind of circling uh, that area right now. One viewer said that the lights appeared to be moving north to south. We have calls into law enforcement as well as Sky Harbor to find out exactly what those lights could be. So far, it's a mystery. Similar lights were reported in the sky last Friday. The phone is just ringing off the hook right now. And of course, Phoenix was the site of uh, these famous flying lights back in the 1990s. If you were here, you probably would not forget. Those five lights flying in formation have always been controversial. The military always said they were part of a routine flare exercise, but a lot of people didn't buy that explanation. It was the largest mass UFO sighting of all time.
these beautiful beasts' lives are under threat, and with them the rest of the world's wildlife. The Earth's population of mammals, birds, fish and invertebrates has declined by more than 60% since 1970, putting the world on course for the first mass extinction of animal life since the dinosaurs. A new report from the WWF and the Zoological Society of London paints a pretty grim picture of human impact on Earth. But UNESCO's World Heritage Committee has passed a resolution that reaffirms the Islamic nature of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem, Al-Quds. The resolution also condemns Israel for acts against Islamic holy sites in the city. It slams the, quote, aggressions by the Israeli occupation authorities. The majority of the 21-nation committee voted for the resolution proposed by Palestinians and Jordanians. The annual meeting was held in Paris on Wednesday. Israel's representative to the UN has reacted angrily, calling the resolution craziness. It claims that the UN is trying to remove Jewish people from their historical homeland. Also, following the vote, Tel Aviv recalled its UNESCO representative to demonstrate dissatisfaction. Meanwhile, the Palestinian ambassador to UNESCO has condemned Israel for politicizing religion.